but uh, Dan Burkholder is our juror this year. And um, before I properly welcome Dan and introduce him with a few words, um, there are a couple of announcements that I want to make first. So um, we, as you can all see, we're still on Zoom, but uh, we are all hoping that maybe by 2023, we can do in person again, or maybe even a hybrid situation. I'm so happy that Dan has been here before. So it's not just a Zoom experience, but he knows this place. And uh, so I feel that uh, he's not losing out too badly, um, even though it's, as we just discussed, it's 16 years ago um, since he was here the last time. Um, <clears throat> Rarified Light um, is also doing, a, well, APC, we are also doing a workshop with Dan this weekend. It starts tomorrow evening and will run through Sunday. It's going to be on Zoom and a little bit more on that later. And uh, I think Dan will say a few words about that too. The show will open in Anchorage at APU in November and then travel um, for a year. It will be here in Anchorage, go to Fairbanks. Um, it'll go to Kenai. And for the first time in 2023, it'll also be at the Valdez Museum. And uh, it will be there all summer next year from June through August. So that's kind of exciting. We've got a new venue. Um, we want to thank all participants in Rarified Light and all our members for your continued support. And uh, we are very excited about, uh, about this, this upcoming show. Um, we will announce the show through CAFE next week, but what I am, the exciting part is tonight that I can announce the honorary mentions and uh, our best of show. Um, honorary mentions are by Susan Andrews and um, her photograph is called uh, Summer Celebration. Susan Biggs, um, has an honorary mention for birthday friends. Johanna Grasso is um, also honored this year with her piece called Innocence. Andrea Jacobson um, with Light in the Forest and Joe Cashy with at Soldotna Airport Autumn. And last but certainly not least, our best of show this year is Alice Bailey and her piece is called Rock Salt. And I'm just curious, I, I was trying to see the, the names. I don't know whether any of you are in the Zoom room tonight, but congratulations and we'll be sending your prizes out to you. And um, so we're very, very happy and really looking forward to seeing the work. Um, as I said before, the rest of the announcements um, for the show um, are going to be made next week. We had, and I don't have the number right in front of me now, Bonnie, you might remember it. I think we had 460 pieces with 70 photographers. Correct. Um, yeah. So, uh, and uh, we will be showing, um, uh, I think the show will have 44 pieces plus the five honorary mentions and the best of show. So let me come to Dan. And uh, first of all, thank you, um, Dan, for being our juror and for teaching the workshop. Um, Dan is known for looking over photography's horizon to discover exciting new ways to capture and express the photographic image. In the early 1990s, he wrote the groundbreaking book, Making Digital Negatives for Contact Printing, opening doors for legions of image makers wishing to combine the precision of digital imaging with the warmth and charm of the handmade print. After Hurricane Katrina ravaged the Gulf Coast in 2005, Dan recorded the chaos of post-Katrina New Orleans in his poignant monograph, the Color of Loss, the first coffee table book photographed entirely with HDR or high dynamic range techniques. 
And in 2012, he led the mobile photography revolution with his forward-looking book, iPhone Artistry. He has a BA and master's degree in photography from Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, California, and his platinum, palladium, and pigmented ink prints are included in private and public collections internationally. Dan's website is, for those of you who haven't looked yet, www.danburkholder.com. So by all means, um, have, a, have a look. And um, so Dan, as I said, we'll be teaching a workshop. He'll be talking a little bit about that. We have sessions tomorrow night and then two sessions each on um, Saturday and Sunday. Um, the, the title of the uh, workshop, or the title of tonight's lecture is going to be a funny thing happened on the way to the dark room. And I'm gonna be intrigued for those of you who've seen the, uh, um, musical, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. So I'm curious, Dan, to see um, <laughs> where the analogy lies. Uh, but uh, without further ado, um, welcome. And uh, we are thrilled to have you and looking forward to looking at your images and listening to you. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thanks for the thanks for the uh, truthful introduction. Nearly everything you said was was real. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know how much pride one can take when their alma mater is no longer in business. But Brooks what? Institute shut down a number of years ago after some, you know, they were bought up by like a foreign firm and then they sold off their assets. Sad story, but a wonderful school. And I think any any higher education amounts to our paying someone big dollars to kick us in the ass and make us learn stuff that we could have learned on our own, but wouldn't, right? That's so um, that's it's a valuable thing. So is it okay if I share my screen? I see right now that Shelly is sharing her screen. Is it okay if I, I do share? not want to share my screen and I'm trying to get this thing working Shelley. and I don't know what to do here. Let's, let's see if I kick you off. If I try, maybe it'll automatically evict you from this space. <laughs> uh, it will stop all the, yeah, it's going to boot you off, but it sounds like that's a good thing, right? Yeah, so I'll just share my desktop here <laughs> and, and jump over to a uh, keynote down here. And uh, let me get up here to the top of Kino. We were doing a practice run here. Okay, so you're seeing a nice, beautiful gray screen at this moment, correct? Correct. Yes. Great. Okay, and you know, the, you, know you you mentioned about the uh, the the title of the image or the uh, of the lecture, and I like to kind of use. You know, we're going to talk about the arc of my career, and um, it's sort of like the arc of a plot in a TV series. But I think it kind of mirrors and give, certainly gives us an opportunity to talk about the change that has taken place in our in our medium. And it's no secret that photography has been impacted so much more than most other artistic media. And that that's a thrilling thing. So I say, if you don't like change, you pick the wrong medium. Um, consider pottery instead. And of course, I've just offended all the potters in the audience. But um, but that's part of the thrill. And I think. You know, if you're really going to enjoy photography as much as possible, you got to roll with some of that change. And that doesn't mean that we become anti film or anti dark room. I still love working in the wet dark room, printing platinum. Um, but it means that you can't do it all, but you appreciate it all. It's sort of like, you know, photography is sort of like your spouse. You wouldn't say to your spouse, I love you, baby, except for those big ass ears you got. You wouldn't do that. You know, you love all of that person. So, what we're going to do here is start off in this talking about this arc and which mirrors photography's own kind of changes. This is my personal path, this first section with photography. And the way I do this, and I've been showing these slides for so many years, I just I really love this section. We're going back to, with this photo of the bird in the tree to 1956 when I was in the first grade. And this was in a pre-photographic era when my medium of choice was crayon at that time. So you can see the bird in the tree. I think it's a smudge. It looks like the bird smoking a cigarette, but I think that's maybe a smudge of crayon or something on there. And you'll notice also how I ran out, signing my name at the top, I ran out of space. And I still do that today when I'm signing forms, I run out of space. So, but this is 1956. And what we're gonna do is juxtapose a current image with that. So 1956, and then here's an image that expressed as about a nine by 19 uh, platinum palladium print the title of this image is Speckled Vulture in Pine Forest. 
So, and this is a composite. It was done back before Photoshop have, had layers. I'm, many of you don't, can't relate to that because you've worked on Photoshop has always had layers. That's the, one of the few reasons there is to work in Photoshop anymore uh, to take advantage of their layering. That's one of the big features of Photoshop as opposed to say Lightroom. So let's go back to 1956. We have the building in the center. And I wish I could tell you that was a camera with a tripod, but I think it was some kind of ray gun or something I drew over there on the right. So then we go to a contemporary image, the flat iron in spring. And this image is actually a pigment over platinum. And I'll show you a couple other examples of those where, where I run the, uh, the watercolor paper through the Epson printer to put a light wash of color down. In this case, that aquamarine, which I was trying to, uh, you know, honor like Steichen's, his one of his, pig, uh, one of his gum over platinum prints, where she used that very similar kind of aquamarine. Uh, but then after putting the pigment down with the Epson, then I hand coat the platinum sensitizer, of course, make a digital negative, because I wrote this book so many years ago, and then expose that. So all the blacks and all the detail come from the platinum palladium, but the color comes from the Epson. So, so now we're back here in 1956, and notice the bold use of symmetry in this example with the trees on the side and the building in the center. And then if we go to the contemporary image, this is School and Trees Scotland. Now, this is a composite done again in like around 1994. Um, everything in there did come from Scotland, except for that little one room schoolhouse there that, that was the school in Texas where Lyndon Johnson, the president, went to school. And that shape, whether you interpret it as a road or a shadow, uh, it's just a shape that was created in Photoshop, as was the, the vignette on the sky. So I got one more example here, and this was from 1956 done in crayon. This was so advanced, the teacher didn't refer to this as postmodern. She called it post-futurist. No, that's a joke, believe it or not. But so here we are in 1956. And then here's a photograph I made in, in uh, the Netherlands at this train station. So th the point is, and it's a rather obvious point, is that there's powerful evidence that our aesthetic ROM chip, you know, the way we start to respond to visuals, uh, the visuals you would like, the ones we don't like, and how we tr try to you know, to use that that response to create our own work or our own artwork. That's burned. That ROM chip is burned very early on, and it could be because of, say, the wallpaper around your crib when you're when you're a baby, or it could be because of the texture of your father's beard or the shape of your mother's breasts. Lots of influences. But I like to I like to advise people that if, if you find yourself drawn to those same things, whether it's lighting patterns, textures, you know, just design honor that but make sure it's coming from in here and not because you saw a judy dater or a john sexton or a martha kasanov show down at the museum the week before make sure it's really coming from in your heart now this next section here i'm going to talk about the transition from classic to digital imaging and notice i'm not using the term analog i really don't like that term it's kind of an ugly term to talk about something as as wonderful as you know chemical-based photography, the truly light-sensitive things beyond the sensor. Um, so Dushan Stulak, I was actually on a train ride. He used to be with the Getty Museum um, over in uh, Scotland years ago for an event, and he used the term the classic era of photography. And I thought that was so elegant as opposed to analog. So the classic era was our pre-digital era. Now we're in the digital era, and there will be some other era. We may be sculpting our images with gamma waves, you know, in, in 10 years. Who knows? But I guarantee you something else is coming down the road. That's part of the thrill, right? If there weren't, we'd lose interest. So this image, for instance, of this of this woman in a window of an actually an abandoned radio station with the bats, which of course I used to think when I was single that this was every woman's dream to sit naked with bats flying around. Uh, but might explain why I, I stayed single up until like 26 years ago. But there's nothing digital about this. This was put together in the dark room. And I got to do just one of a couple name drops. Uh, one of my mentors was Jerry Ulsman, who we just lost in the past couple months. He was the master of the composite image. And I was fortunate enough to get to uh, work with him and be his assistant in the dark room a couple times. And Jill and I just two years ago visited him at his home in Gaines, uh, Gainesville, Florida. And it was the last time I got to see him. But one of the masters, one of the the term giant is ever used, but he was definitely one of the giants of our time in photography. So it was done by moving the print uh, from one and larger to the other, and pretty burning the birds, uh, the bats in with one, and the foreground and the uh, model with another. Uh, so there's nothing digital about that image. This image, which is actually one of the, my favorite images in my portfolio, there's nothing digital about this. This dates all the way back to 1983 when we didn't have digital capture, of course. 
So this was shot on film using a soft focus lens on an Icon F3. And, but I processed, it was Triax film, processed the Triax in paper developer, actually Ethol LPD for old timers. And that gave a very, a very prominent grain. That was the way we had to, things we had to do to create grain. Now we could shoot it straight. We could do the, the, you know, the stylized and we could do the grain effect. We could do all that digital, but we didn't have those, those ways to do it back then. But then on the silver print, I'd make a silver print. And then I used a bleaching potassium ferrocyanide with a brush to raise the tones, like on the tank top straps and the tones on the space to guide the viewer's eye. Because, you know, one of our jobs as still photographers is to orchestrate eye movements for our viewer to get them their eye to move around that to elicit a certain kind of emotional response. And then I would, to make a platinum print, I would then photograph that silver print that had all the burning, dodging, bleaching, etching, spotting built in. I'd photograph it on a copy stand with a special copy film that we used to have available with either a 4x5 or 5x7 camera. And that gave me a negative that I could contact print. Now, you count the number of wet steps in that before you ever get to platinum print, and it's pretty exhausting. So now we can make, like with the Epson, the P900 sitting behind me, we can make a beautiful inkjet negative right on our desktop. And if someone had told us 25 years ago we'd be able to do that, we'd have said, oh, you're, you're full of it. But that's what's happened with photography. Uh, there's another one from the Jeanette series, same thing, uh, that soft com combining hard grain with soft, soft focus lens, but also bleaching on the image. Uh, this image, this was also shot on film back whew, probably in the in the 80s sometime uh, in India. And this pilgrim was washing her sari there in the early morning as the sun was blasting into uh, the 20 millimeter Nikkor lens. And think about it, that pilgrim, she was receiving the same ambient light as these boats in the background. So if I hadn't used flash fill, she would have been silhouetted just like those boats. So that might have been charming in its own way, but I think it's more visually engaging the way the flash, it didn't overpower the light coming through her. Sorry, I love the way it's coming through the, you feel the translucency and on the bubbles of the fabric, but there's nothing digital about that. Nothing digital about this image, dog going to church in Paris. This is from 1986. And you couldn't make this photo today because that's Notre Dame steeple in the background, the spire. And of course that collapsed during that horrible fire, of Notre Dame uh, several years ago. But what I want to point out in here, this, you know, I'd set up a tripod actually for a uh, 21 millimeter Sigma lens. It was on Nikon at the time. And just love this, uh, this curve and the curb and the, and the church being back there and found out years later that Ajay photographed the same corner. So he obviously had good taste, but I made a negative and then noticed this dog coming down the street. So I cocked the shutter again as the dog entered the frame, made another photo. And of course, never printed the one without the dog. The dog makes everything about the photo. But do you notice the left rear leg on the dog? Le dog's legs don't bend that way. That is a camera time distortion. As the dog moved through that like eighth or 15th of a second exposure, it, it's a camera time thing that only photography can do. We, we wouldn't think about a dog's legs bending that way. And I love it when the photographic process shows its own hand and reveals something that's not really there. And remember, over and over, I tell students and colleagues, it's not called reality, it's called photography. It's a very, very different thing. Um, reason I show this image, Bald Boy Kathmandu, is because I honestly don't remember whether I got this kind of glow effect in the wet dark room under the enlarger by putting diffusion material under the enlarging lens or made it in Photoshop because I was at that transitional era when I was, you know, changing gears from wet dark room, especially some of the printing control over to digital control. And you can't get that effect when shooting. So these people say, oh, you shouldn't do any post processing. I disagree with that strongly. Um, by diffusing on the enlarging lens, the, the blacks bleed, you know, photography means writing with light. So when we diffuse under the enlarging lens, the, the light is coming through the thin areas of the negative, it's the dark tones, and that spreads those. And it gives a much more beautiful effect than diffusing on the camera lens where the highlights glow. Uh, but there's, of course, a way to do that digitally. And I, in fact, we'll probably, well, I, well, we might cover it in the workshop coming up. The, this, the iPhone workshop, I would encourage you to take it. We're going to have a lot of fun and it's going to reveal a lot of wonderful uh, techniques and approaches for, for your iPhone photography. And that starts up tomorrow evening. Um, you know, this image is called A Man Lifting Catfish with Penis. And we're back in Kathmandu now. And he was actually standing, this is digital. He was, of course, he was standing on a, on a rock. He actually popped out behind a temple and said, want to see me lift heavy rock with male organ? I said, sure. I'm just after beauty or visual intrigue. Uh, that's, you know, the rather modest goals. 
So of course, you know, I put him in the water and had to make the pond ripples and create the reflection from him. Um, and I, this Rorschach thing in the background, it's just so, I don't do that anymore because it's just so sinfully easy to do, though I did artfully move some of the lichens and moss around back there so it's not perfectly symmetric. But I want to point out that you see, he was actually lifting a 120 pound rock with this loop of cloth that was around the rock and then he you know, was at the base of his organ. And I've tried this and I can only get up like 17 pounds, but also not only do my tendons in my neck stick out like this, but my tongue comes out of the corner of my mouth. So I wanted to point that out. You know, this image, uh, this is pigs in frozen paradise. And Jill, my wife, says, I have a talent for making images that no one wants to buy. But actually, I've sold a couple of these prints over the years. It's only printed as like a 12 by 18 platinum print. This is a composite. Uh, and we did have layers by the time I got to this image in like 95. Uh, we, I think with version 3 of Photoshop, and not CS3, but 3, we got layers finally. So there are three pieces to this image. Uh, the, the church in Rio de Cotorce, Mexico. Uh, the, the adobe, which is also in Mexico, and then the pigs, which was down in Tehuantepec, Mexico. And when I got back and looking at proof sheets, it just seemed like those three pieces needed to be united. And of course, this has become like a signature image from 1994. Uh, this was before we had layers also, and I don't suggest that's a good way to work, but I just like to point out that's all we had at the time. But there, in fact, uh, we'll actually work with this image um, or one similar in the workshop when we talk about layering with our iPhone, because we have some wonderful apps. Uh, we don't have Photoshop on iPhone. We have Photoshop on iPad. I'm kind of disappointed. It's getting better, but I'm kind of disappointed in Photoshop on iPad, especially since Adobe several years ago promised it would be a full, had all the features of our desktop version. It does not. It's getting better slowly. But we have some other apps that are very close in terms of layering capability that we can use on our iPhone. Uh, and we'll certainly address those when we, we talk about layering and compositing. Now, back of like about 17, 18 years ago or so, I wasn't ready to give up black and white. Um, but I was like many photographers, you know, we were starting to get interested in color because we now had we had fixed two issues with color photography, lack of permanence, even see the old Zebrachrome, or then it became Ophrachrome. It would still, after 75 years under display conditions, start to fade. Uh, digital addressed that with archival pigments like we have in our Canons and Epsons now. And also the issue of control. And if you've ever worked in a color dark room in total darkness and getting the paper out, it's a horrible place. It's nothing like the silver dark room printing silver gelatin where you have safe lights on and can see what you're doing so you can see more of the magic. So, but also digital addressed the issue of control when printing color. So a lot of us became interested. And you know the plot. I ran the ran the watercolor paper through the apps and, and then hand coded the sensitizer, made a digital negative, put it in registration. So these these are not like a phony border effect. Those are actually those are hand coded uh, platinum marks from coating the paper with a platinum sensitizer. Here's another pigment over platinum. This one from Prague. Uh, this image this is image from Scotland. Uh, uh, What's it called? Car and Road? Anyway, uh, road, road and Hill, I believe it is. And with that valley in the background. So this is the way the image is presented. But I want to show you how it started. See, see if you see any difference. So this is the original. Do you notice any difference at all? You might have to squint. Um, now, that car for the final really was there, but just not in that same frame. I, I wanted to have the feeling of isolation when I was on the top of this moor there in Scotland. But soon, real well, not soon, but after about a half an hour, I realized that either there were no cars or there was a truck slowly climbing up the hill with a line of cars stuck behind him. So I just took, finally, I said, I just got to shoot the line of cars and then just use one uh, and, you know, just let him come in for the layer in Photoshop. But it wasn't about the lush foliage in the, in the more, um, it was about the aerial perspective and having that beautiful line of the road almost to make the road almost feel uh, wet with the reflection of the light. You know, back about 15 years ago, right after Jill and I moved from Texas to upstate New York, where I'm located now, just 20 minutes from Woodstock, um, I got to, and I've already been printing platinum since 1984. So I thought, well, how can I make the platinum process even more difficult and, and more expensive? And platinum's not really difficult at all, but it can get expensive, especially with the cost of palladium having skyrocketed so much in, in recent years. So I thought, well, I'll add another precious metal, gold. So now, of course, I teach this whole gilding process, how to print on vellum and then put gold leaf, silver leaf, white gold, moon gold, you know, gesso, all these other things on the print. 
So this is the very first example I did of an image from 1989 shot on film, uh, but I did gild, printed it in platinum and then gilded it with 24 karat gold on the back. And there's another example. I did a grant project down in Pennsylvania a number of years ago, um, shooting down there in Amish country. And um, this is one uh, shooting with a 400 millimeter lens on full frame at the time of this carriage coming towards the uh, coming towards the camera. Uh, this was about a half hour exposure of uh, trees and truck at night. And this was in North Texas, actually at my in-laws uh, old house. Uh, they're now gone. They were wonderful people, but they're gone now. Uh, and this was high dynamic range years ago. So it took multiple exposures to get shadow detail, like in the trunk of the tree that was strongly backlit by like a street lamp and to get detail everywhere else. But that was then gilded as a 12 by 18 platinum print. And there's a, a pano uh, stitch from Big Ben, Texas uh, with gold leaf. And this is an iPhone image um, shot with the iPhone, of course, uh, and then gilded with, uh, of course it was run through stylizing apps also, but then gilded. Um, now, Petra mentioned uh, this book called The Color of Loss. And, you know, Katrina hit the Gulf Coast and New Orleans in particular back in 2005. In 2006, Jill and I made several trips down to New Orleans. And the first time, we didn't even know we'd photographed, but we knew we wanted to see what both Mother Nature and government failure had done to the people of New Orleans. You know, when you have people begging for help for days on rooftops, that's a sign of governmental failure. Um, so we went down and, you know, we'd seen a lot of pictures of the debris outside, collapsed homes, but I found that I, there was a more personal story to be told inside. And there was no way to photograph these very dark, but very contrasty interiors with sunlight hitting windows, but very dark inside with mud on the walls without doing high dynamic range. So uh, this was all shot with high dynamic range. This is the cover of the book, this uh, a wagon and window. And this was, most of these were shot in the lower ninth ward. And this uh, a diploma on the wall was actually a high school diploma that the people who lived there were, were rightfully proud of. I'll just show you a few others. This church, these pews were not nailed down. This, this church in the lower ninth ward had been underwater for between 10 days and two weeks. And you can see the fan blades up on the ceiling had softened uh, from being submerged in water. And then as the water receded, the fan blades were soft and drooped. And then the uh, the pews came down to rest. You can see how this the pew, like in the foreground, it acted like a trough and had water in it before it dried out. And very contrasty because there were just these like foot wide slit windows on the sides for light coming in there. Uh, this was a high school that is no longer there. We did a we went back here a number of years later, and you would not have ever known that a whole high school complex had been there. There wasn't a just a grass field, not a bit of construction material remaining. They cleaned it up completely. And so many people had left New Orleans, there wasn't a need to rebuild the high school. There just weren't kids to go to high school anymore. And this was the last image in the book of this hymnal on a church pew. And Jill, my wife, she was the first to notice that, see the stem that had washed in from outside as the water came in, is leaning against the book. And there's ambiguity, like, where does the man-made material end and the organic material begin. There's this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of confusion, which I think is, is very beautiful uh, and very organic. And in the big print, you can see the words like uh, mercy and Lord and things in the, in the hymnal. Now, of course, iPhone photography, and that's a big deal now. And, and Petro mentioned, I wrote this book 10, I can't believe it's been 10 years ago. I actually wrote it uh, turned the manuscript in 11 years, 11 and a half years ago. The company of Pixic Press, they were great to work with, but they were so slow, uh, just un unsuitably slow in, in this digital era for the way things is, things are changing so quickly in photography. Um, but I can't believe it's been that long that I wrote that book. But let's go let's go over some uh, you know some discussion about shooting with a smartphone. I've used the iPhone just because it's easier. Um, and I think it's a better photographic platform, but we're not going to have that argument. But I still do this. You know, one of the first things I did when I got a smartphone, my first uh, camera smartphone was actually a, a Palm Pilot that had a camera built in and a web browser. So you could photograph and actually email your images. But I'll do this. I just did this a couple weeks ago when we left to teach in Santa Fe. Jill and I were both teaching classes there. And I take a picture of where I park in the parking lot so I can find the car when I get back a week or two later. And then I started doing more serious things. And, you know, one of the reasons we moved up here was because the Hudson River Valley is just gorgeous. And the Hudson River School of Painters, it was America's first real own art movement. It wasn't something carried over from Europe. It was something germinated here in our country. So I wanted to, you know, kind of honor that with the color, you know, the warm colors and the texture. 
So this is just like, you know, 10 minutes from where we live uh, with a bridge over Catskill Creek. Uh, this is a picture actually from Florence where Jill and I were both teaching a class. And this is where we're going to talk about photography showing its own hand again. This crew boat, which a crew boat is like eight people, right? Eight rowers was going down the Arno River. And with the sweet pano on the iPhone, as the boat went by, I panned with in pano mode with the boat. And it stretched it out to this like 40 person crew boat. This is not a digital effect. This is a photographic effect. It's a camera time distortion. So this would happen if you had like an old Roblox camera, the pivoting lens or an old circuit camera, um, you would get the same effect. So it is not a digital effect. Now the blurring of the background to give that kind of tilt shift thing that was done actually in Snapseed, which we'll be talking about and, and certainly revealing some wonderful techniques in Snapseed that even people that think they know Snapseed, I think are gonna be thrilled. Uh, this image of the of uh, going across the George Washington Bridge, and Jill and I just finished presenting down in New York City. We were driving home, so we crossed the George Washington Bridge. And I asked Jill; she was in the pasture. And she said, "Will you hold the steering wheel for a second so I can take a picture?" And Jill said, "I'm not going to hold the steering wheel crossing the George Washington Bridge in the rain." And of course, my response was, "Well, someone should because I'm doing photography." But she was a good sport; she held the wheel. So I shot this with like an iPhone 3GS. Uh, and then stylized it and made it look like this. Uh, and we could do that in the palm of our hand, which I think is pretty special. Down in Sonora, Mexico, uh, with an iPhone 4 or 4S, I'm not sure which, but in this little Mexican convenience store, there was this Mexican cowboy and just the graphics of his sunglasses on his hat were too good to resist. And this is printed as a small, precious uh, platinum print with 24 karat gold leaf behind it. Uh, Beacon Newburgh Bridge. This was the first gilded print where I started to grind metals together because, you know, I found that like high key images did not work in gold. Like I tried doing some snow pictures from here in the in the winter, and gold overpowers the image. Gold is a very powerful yellow color, right? It's a powerful metal. So, and yellow water when it's pure yellow, it looks like pee, right? It's not a good thing. It's sort of like you know Charlie Brown said, "Don't eat the yellow snow" for good reason. So what I did, I ground together for the first time palladium and gold, like a three to one, three, three leaves of palladium to one leaf of gold to get a, a softer but slightly warm tone. And I did the water and kind of feathered it out, the pure gold on the ends, but to get that kind of split tone effect. Uh, here's a, this is uh, printed as an inkjet print with gesso on the back of vellum uh, from Florence, uh, shot with an iPhone 5 there in, excuse me, Venice, in Venice. Now I throw this in just for the heck of it, just to catch, uh, make, make you wake up a little bit. Do you ever get drunk? Now this is an image that was shot in 2001. This was six years before we had an iPhone, right? So it obviously was not shot with the iPhone, but I was writing a review testing this Nikon Coolpix 5000. It was one of the first five megapixel cameras we had back then, big whoop for, at the time. And Nikon had let me the auxiliary lenses screwed on to give you an ultra wide, like we shot with this there in the Czech Republic. And I'd worked it over in Photoshop and stuff and could never really bring it to fruition. And then about, I don't know, five years ago or so, I airdropped it like from the Mac over to the iPhone and started to work on it and having a much wider assortment of stylizing control in the palm of my hand, I was able to finally give that image the feel that I wanted. You know, we're always trying to make our images not look the way we saw them, but to feel the way we saw them, right? Uh, and, uh, and I'll give you a tip. One of the things I did for this image the aspect ratio of the iPhone uh, is three by four, right? It's like the aspect ratio of a medium format Fuji or Hasselblad. Three by four is the new modern contemporary aspect ratio. I shoot with micro four thirds when I want a bigger camera. That's also three by four. There's a lot of compelling evidence that three by four is a more modern aspect ratio than two by three or square. But anyway, instead of cropping that, I squeezed it down. You could do this in Photoshop, but I did on the iPhone, squeezed it down from three by four to three by three. So Nothing was cropped out, but everything in there is 25% narrower. And it gives this beautiful kind of a Tolkien-esque, almost Flemish painting kind of feel, and, and coupled with the stylized. It's just a beautiful kind of thing. Um, talking about HDR, this was a, after Jill and I finished teaching in Florence, we spent a few days traveling around Tuscany. And it, one morning saw this, sh this shepherd moving these sheep from one field to the other. So I jumped out of the car with just my iPhone, ran over, and I used an HDR app to shoot this. At the time, it was called HDR3. And even back then, it did a wonderful job of a very contrast scene. Of course, I did other textural control on there of the passing sheep. 
Now let's talk a little bit about resolution. Uh, the title of this image is uh, Factory and Creek at Dusk. And this is printed with like copper or gold leaf on the back. And this is the way it felt when I photographed it. I, we're going to talk about resolution, but I want you to see how this started. So here is, here's the original shot. And this is out of the car window driving up the thruway in New York past this factory. So we have about this much. So if you, this was an eight megapixel camera, like an iPhone four or four S. So four megapixel, everything up till the six S was or eight megapixels, excuse me. So if you divide that in quarters, you'd have two megapixel, but we have much less than that. If you divide that in, in, in quarters again, so it was less than half a megapixel, probably about like, you know, 350 kilopixels or something. I mean, it's just no resolution at all. But it wasn't about resolution. We're trying to create not numerically perfect images. We're trying to create images with some soul and some spirit to them. So don't get hung up on a resolution. Uh, this is another image. Uh, this was shot in the Aran Islands with, uh, with the Olympus, with the long lens, but processed on the iPhone. But this is another example where I squeeze that three by four down to three by three. So everything is compressed horizontally and it really works on certain subject matter. Uh, this image was actually shot in New Mexico. This is the cover of the book from uh, 10 years ago, uh, the iPhone artistry book. Now here, some of you are going to say, oh, I'm not going to do any of that texturizing stuff. That's not me. And I understand that. That's why I, I put this little slide in of the Tin Man at the Pilates class saying this is bullshit. Uh, that's all right. You know, we, we know, like in the class, we don't have an agenda. I'm not, I'm not teaching a texturizing class. We're talking about a class that will, will appeal to anyone and give you more control with your, with your mobile photography. Um, another, another, it wasn't a grant project, but I was hired by the city of Buffalo back about oh, five or six years ago. They had seen some of my work and they said, we want you to come and we want to hire you for a week to photograph and you can do anything you want. We've seen your iPhone stuff. I said, well, that's, I can't do that. That's the week when I usually iron my shoelaces. So, but they finally talked me into it. So I went up and I'm just going to show you a few examples. Uh, and many of these were processed on the iPhone shot with the Olympus in most cases, but then processed on the iPhone. I love that synergy that putting those two together. I just love that workflow. And now we can, of course, Wi-Fi our raw files from our iPhone over to our iPhone or iPad and work on them. It's just a, it's a thing of beauty to be able to do that, especially for travel photography. So these were all from the city of Buffalo, which of course is on the Great Lake. Now, a few years ago, uh, there, we were having the, we we're celebrating, I, I don't know if celebrating, uh, we were honoring the, the, the First World War. It was 100 years since the First World War, the Great War took place. And so I wanted to do something to kind of be a tribute to the soldiers and civilians of the First World War. Um, and you'll see the dates from 1914 to 1918, so 2014 to 2018. So what I did, I'll show you this first example. This is this is a sad iron. That's what they're called. And there was a there was a, a kerosene reservoir down here. And this knob was to adjust the wick for the flame. Now normally this mica window, and mica is a magical substance. I love working with mica. Uh, this would be clear, and this would be you'd see your flame in here. So you'd adjust this knob to get your flame at the right uh, right height and temperature to heat up in a pre-electric times to heat up your iron for ironing clothes. So in this project, I took these period appropriate devices, sat irons and some other things, as you'll see, and cleaned, cleaned them all out, uh, painted them with like white titanium to reflect light, uh, wired them with LEDs inside, uh, and then printed images on backlight film and sandwiched with epoxy in between sheets of fresh mica. And of course, these images are not from me because they were shot 100 years ago. But let's zoom in on this image because I want, I want you to see this image. So we're talking about an image now over a hundred years ago. This is photographed, and everything about this image is wonderful. Uh, and this is one of the first. You know, the French actually developed the autochrome method, which was the first color photography. They actually used potato starch uh, in the material in the film to capture color. But you look at the the posing, the tonality, the gesture. Everything is just just so sweet about this. And, you know, we 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 think we got to. So good. Think about the, the tools they had 100 years ago, and they, and they made wonderful images like this. We'd be hard pressed to be able to do anything this nice today. Uh, this, in this example, this is actually called a Stonebridge lantern, actually made here in New York State. And they were made for soldiers. They, they used a, uh, a candle inside, 
and they were known to be resistant in the trenches. They, the candle wouldn't blow out. They were vented so that the candle might flicker a little bit. It wouldn't blow out in the trenches. So this had three sides with mica, so you can see the, so the light could come out from the flame. So I took that out and printed. It was kind of a pano image of these German soldiers with their gas masks on and their beer steins. I'm, with a name like Burkholder, I can make fun of the Germans. But... Um, but it was really like Planet Bizarro for, you know, with this Last Supper kind of thing with these German officers around there. So I stripped it into three vertical images in the mica uh, going around there. And this was actually a dark room, a kerosene powered dark room safe light. And there's the knob for adjusting the flame. And this actually had a red filter, glass filter in for safe light and the candle that would be for making light in the dark room. Um, but of course, I stripped that out and put this image of a German soldier with his grenade belt in there instead. Uh, this next little section as we work through is called traveling with a camera and you know jerry ulsman something he said with his great wisdom that you know he says when you have a camera with you you're going to be more visually aware and plus he said you get away with bizarre behavior you know if you see an interesting rock laying there at the side of the road if you're just kneeling down and looking at a rock people are going to think there's something wrong with you they might call the authorities but if you have a camera or even you know a mobile phone now that everyone has a camera then people driving by say, oh, isn't that sweet? Uh, he or she is going to take a picture of the rock. So we can really get away with a lot more uh, in terms of behavior if we have a camera with us. But now, you know, it's not as much of an intentional act because we all, we pick up our phones and go out the door. Back, you know, years ago, we'd have to make that extra effort to pick up a discrete camera. Uh, this picture was from Cologne. There's the, that, that's the cathedral in the background, the person crossing the bridge. Uh, horseman the, uh, in Mexico, excuse me, Cuba. This is Cuba. Uh, in the early morning in uh, Vinales, Cuba. Beautiful light in the morning with the horsemen there. And by the way, the lens that I shot these next several images uh, is an ultra wide, a six millimeter Kawa. And I'm going to be selling, I use, it's only, it only works on micro four thirds. It's a magic lens. Um, but I'm going to be selling it because I got another six millimeter um, that I saved up for. But these were, these were shot with that six millimeter. It's, and I love ultra wides. I, everyone wants to get a telephoto. I think all, wides are so much more intimate. Um, and you can just do, this was shot with the Kawa lens in Cuba, in Hershey, uh, Cuba, actually. And this was in the outs, uh, this was in, in Havana there of the, uh, of the market person. And this was also shot, um, just outside of, um, outside of Havana of the fisherman with his, with his catch. And this was shot, this was not shot with the, with the fish, or excuse me, the ultra wide. This was shot with like a, a 24 to 200 equivalent, a wonderful travel lens. Um, and just love the way that the camera caught the wall in motion and the shadow under the ball that adds so much energy to the photo. You feel the tension with the ball suspended there with the mural in the background. And I've made eight trips to Cuba so far. We hope to go back now that the COVID uh, whole era is maybe passing. Uh, actually, next month or at the end of this month, going to be going to Mongolia, which kind of breaks my rule about you hit the you hit the rough countries when you're young and can still run fast. Um, so it may be a mistake, but Jill and I are going there, and I hope to hope to get some good images there. But out of the eight trips to Cuba, this is my favorite, uh, and I did not ask these people the barber shop at night, and the only light source in there was this fluorescent lamp on the wall, and it's almost operatic. I just love the. The gesture here and they i didn't ask them to pause they were just the guy was cutting the person's hair uh the the young boxing student at rest uh just confronting the camera and then in trinidad cuba the, the town of trinidad not the not the country of trinidad uh the the uh fire breather and the only light source was his torch and then he'd spit out a mouthful of kerosene it would vaporize and make that flame um other parts, the uh, other parts that's in uh, Peru, and this is also this horseman in Peru, and of course this was style, shot with the Olympus, but then stylized um, on the iPhone. And we're going to jump over to Romania, which we're actually going back to for Christmas and New Year's this year. I love Romania and at, over the winter when it, the snow and it's very the landscape is so minimalist. Uh, but the Roma or the Gypsies, this was shot back in 2019, just three years ago and just gracious uh, people and so warm to take us into their home and let us let us photograph there's another example of the lady with her sheep out in the yard and in romania the small uh, narrow gauge railroad um our guide is just so good we're going to be seeing him actually in greece in uh, in, in november also and then back in romania 
and this train was going by. You can see the steam coming out from the engine here. And this local guy just came out to stand on that bridge. And just He made the picture. And I love the muted colors, but the color contrast, it just worked really well. And out of the several trips to Romania I've made thus far, uh, this is my favorite photo of the parade watchers there, uh, this lady confronting the camera. Um, as I moved with the parade, she was behind the rope on the sidelines there. And what's so interesting about this, everyone in here is like looking a different direction, every face. It's just, it's like a medley of different facial directions. And it had to be in black and white too. It couldn't, it couldn't be in color because that was a distraction. And the boy on Christmas Day, after the service, he was wearing his formal woolies, they call these on Christmas Day, uh, there right next to the, uh, the graveyard at the church. And, you know, this was, uh, this was shot in Christmas of 2018. And this was, I was shooting the Olympus, a mirrorless camera. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to shoot with a banging mirror anymore. Uh, mirrors solved a problem that no longer exists. And I couldn't have shot this with a DSLR. You know, I would have been asked to leave the church with a banging mirror. So, of course, with silent shutter, you know, we have a mirrorless, zero, zero sound, not just muted sound, but zero sound. Um, I was able to, with this line on Christmas Day in the, uh, there was the uh, like the balcony pew, uh, with these women lined up and I was able to with a very with a fast 1.2 lens focus on the foreground subject and then let the depth of field cascade across the others and they had no idea I was photographing because I there wasn't a shutter sound I now engaged the railroad in the train station the engineer I was waiting I thought he'd probably come over to wipe the steam off the window and he did he took his arm and wiped the steam off so he could look outside and right as he looked out through the oval window I captured that picture of the engineer a uh, blacksmith with a horse in the background. This is hot shoeing in in, um, in Romania, and that's where they heat up the the to almost a red hot the horseshoe, and they burn it into the cuticle. Or it doesn't hurt the horse; it's like clipping your fingernails, right? It's dead tissue, but it's actually a good thing for the horse um, because it seats better. There are no hot high spots or anything. It really meshes in there, and it gives it's, it's more comfortable for the horse. So it's not a bad thing. And they're during a bear festival. And this I shot with a uh, lens baby. So I'm sure some of you heard of lens babies. They're wonderful lens. This was a, a Soul 22, 22 millimeter, which is like a 44 millimeter on full frame since I was shooting on micro four thirds. But boy, you really, uh, I love the way you can shift the, uh, you know, the, the, the sweet spot around. Um, they're not the fastest lens to use, manual focus and everything. Uh, but if you work with it, you get the hang of it. And you really know why they call them Romanians. Doesn't he, he looks like a Roman, doesn't he, with that profile? And uh, here's another picture from there. Uh, and this this young woman who was wearing her bear costume during this festival in the parade, uh, when I aimed the camera at her, she assumed this very theatrical pose, crossing her paws, you know, in front of her face like that. Now, I got to be honest, this bear was, another costume person back here was there. This one I did composite on the iPhone, brought another bear shot in because I needed symmetry in the background. Uh, this, so this one's real, this one is not. And of course, she was real. She was really there with, with her costume on. Um, Vietnam, just a couple of landscapes from Vietnam where I went back in 2019 and just a marvelous, uh, marvelous adventure there. I'll show you some of those photos. There's the tea fields there with the worker honoring the rule of thirds compositionally. And uh, just wonderful color and a beautiful country and very safe to travel there. Uh, very, it was very hot and humid, which can be a problem. Now this, we'll just talk about this a little bit. Um, there are four panels in here. In the upper left, that's actually in the middle of Hanoi, a small lake there where a B-52 that was shot down crashed in 1972. Uh, you can see the tire existing there for, after all these years. Uh, this, this is, you know, this is communist propaganda talking about how the, you know, the American imperialists, in fact, the Vietnamese call it the American War, they don't call it the Vietnam War, uh, which seems to make sense. Now, down here in the lower left, where I'm posing, this lady, and I apologize for not remembering her name, but her husband was killed on December, I think it was the 27th, yeah, just two days after Christmas, when we were doing the Christmas bombing of Hanoi, which was criminal. When this plane was shot down and crashed, her husband was killed by that. And I was honored to meet her and pose with her. 
And actually, I was in prison when that happened. Uh, I was a war resistor during the Vietnam War, and this is my mugshot from from these. Uh, this is when I went in in '71, but I spent a year and a half in there, so I was I was still in when her husband was tragically killed. And then just a few years ago, I, I fortunately New York State still has some money for the arts, and I applied and got a grant to do the snowplow project to kind of you know honor the men and women who you know, make our roads safe in the winter here. So I'll just show you a few of those images here. And it was a great project. And, um, you know, you don't see any women in these photos. I, I kind of edited out some of the, the clerical work and stuff there. I don't think there were any female tow truck or uh, uh, plow drivers. So I apologize for these being just pictures of guys, but there were women in the whole project that I shot for the grant. There, there were very, uh, many important women included. Uh, this is Ron Sherman, who uh, went out in the plow truck. It was a great, uh, great experience. And this is the last image in the series that I presented. Um, and I'm obligated uh, to show this, that, you know, where the money came from, the state of New York, and et cetera, and the Council on the Arts and that stuff to fund that series. Down in Oaxaca, Mexico, which I've been to about six times now, just a wonderful place, real visually rich. I'm going to show you a few photos from there. Oh, by the way, this photo of the son and father, this is in Oaxaca, right in the Zocalo, which is the square. And this was shot with that six millimeter cow that I want to sell. So if you're a micro four third shooter, contact me. I'm going to make a good deal on this. And you'll notice I shoot it with nine by 16 aspect ratio because it's not made for micro four. It's made for a one inch like a closed circuit TV camera. And it's sin this lens is sinfully sharp in the center. It's a crazy, but it does vignette some. So by shooting it instead of three by four, nine by 16, uh, it eliminates some of the vignette. You can still see there's some, uh, but you also get more of a cinematic look. And it's just a really fun lens to photograph with. Now this was photographed with a, a hundred year old a Cook Connect, a lens made for 16 millimeter motion picture. And I love using some of these old classic uncoated lenses. Uh, this man selling these bubble machines and then this guy walking towards during the Christmas festivities. Well, that's with that's with the with the Kala six millimeter again. These people had no idea I was photographing them. They thought I was with like a normal lens photographing the cathedral behind them. Uh, the the musician and he had a, a you know a, a mentally handicapped uh, helper here who had his hat out for the donations and I did I did certainly make a donation because they were both doing a good job. There's that six millimeter again with forced perspectives. Just such a the way it writes light is so beautiful. And this was also like a ninety seven year old a, a Zeiss. Uh, 50 millimeter, so it's like a 100 millimeter portrait lens on micro four thirds, uh, f 1.5 that came from an old context camera that I bought for $25. And it's a, it's a magical lens also with without any multi coating or anything. Now, just a couple of years ago, I thought, you know, I wanted to do something different with and when I was like back in elementary school, I loved a microscope. My parents got me a microscope and I would come home from school and look at paramecium. In fact, that's a paramecium in there. Um, so I thought, what will I do with these? So I thought, well, I'll do them in gold leaf. So I made prints on vellum, put gold leaf on the back. And uh, so then I said, well, what else can, what, what can I do else? So I thought, well, I'll present it honoring the, like a microscope slide, which is the one to three aspect ratio. I'll embed the vellum print cut as a circle in resin to make it look like a slide and a specimen and then a slide. I thought, well, that's kind of neat. So I thought, what else can I do? So I thought, well, let's, uh, there's another example. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll make a mold. So here I'm pour, pouring resin to make a one foot by three foot mold. And there I am holding one. I think that's a piece of pollen or something. I photographed with an iPhone through the microscope with like a $20 adapter. Um, so I did these as one by three foot resin uh, images embedded in uh, resin. Now we're right here towards the end, right on time. And I always like to point out that the most important photos in the world, they're not in the galleries, they're not in the museums, and they definitely are not in my portfolio. Uh, the most important photos that any of us are going to make are these personal images. You know, we like to think we're artists, we're doing, you know, creative things, but keep making those personal images. And this image, uh, this is my mom on the left and my sister, who I just visited. Magellan, I visited her and her husband down in San Antonio a couple weeks ago. This is, of course, from the from the 1980s, a very you know important photo uh, that I cherish. It looks like the wind was blowing. It looks like I got some like John Kennedy thing happening back when I had hair there. Um, and I want to show you one more example. These are the photos that we have on our refrigerators and our wallets, on our dressers, uh, and on our phones, of course. 
Uh, this is a picture. Now, it does not have that beautiful film feel to it. This is from the year 2000. You know what this was shot with? This was shot with a Nikon Coolpix 990, which was 3.3 megapixel. And it was that camera that had a pivoting, a body pivot in the middle, the lens on one side and the LCD on the other. It was a great camera. And these people that say, oh, I shoot film because there's a, a unique look to film. I kind of think that's hogwash, frankly. Um, most people will think this is shot with with uh, on like Tri-X or something. But no, this was shot with that 3.3 megapixel. And with, the, with the, one of the nice features with that tilting LCD, I could shoot at a low angle and still see the image nicely uh, to compose it. And that, that's my stepmother um, at my father's gravesite uh, at his funeral. So those are the important images. And I'm going to plug this one print. Uh, this this is like one of the last images you'll see. I'm selling this as a special edition print. Um, I'm limited to 50, and we're up to like number 30. And I'm doing this to raise money for Ukraine uh, through direct relief. And I only recoup the materials and the shipping. You don't pay shipping. It's a $175 print. It's a beautiful image that I shot in Ukraine several years ago of the shopkeeper. It's really a, a really nice, rich print. Uh, you can buy it from my website and all the money, like I said, except for the shipping and the and the materials, several dollars up, goes to Ukraine relief. Um, so please consider on my website uh, adding to your collection with one of those 20 remaining prints. And then here at the end, words to live by. I always end up, no matter what the what the topic is, uh, this is an actual fortune cookie. Uh, Jill and I years ago were in a Chinese restaurant and got this and and I said, this is wonderful. So I asked Jill if she'd hold it. So I photographed it. And here you are. You're capable, competent, and creative. Prove it. So this was a challenge cookie, uh, which was wonderful. So like in the workshop coming up, we're going to assume that you're all capable, competent, and creative. But your job is, of course, to prove it. And we're going to give you some extra tools to let you do that. And then we finish off with a self-portrait done with an app that put, makes me look like George Washington. And that is it. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing here now. And we'll quit. Bam. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I made it under the deadline thank too, you. right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just after eight. I think we have a little bit of time for Q and A. Sure. Um, Shall we uh, invite people to? Hi, Jason. You made it. Your your class is finished. Good. Yeah. Hi, so, Jason. Uh, so, who has questions? Looks like Matt has his hand up. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Hello. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah, my my uh, uh, connection dropped out, and I just had to jump back on. Looks like I lost my camera, but that's okay. Wonderful presentation, uh, Dan. I oh, glad you liked. Was it. just blown away by the photos, and then the only thing I liked better than the photos was the humor. Uh, <laughs> the the man at the at the yoga class, and uh, and then the, you had to. That was the week you on your shoelaces. <clears throat> that's, that's excuse me. I'm standing outside. Very funny stuff. And you know, I, I've seen photos that make me laugh out loud and uh, your comedy made me laugh out loud, but your photos, I didn't say any comedy in the photos. Do you ever try to imbue or infuse your photos with a with comedy? You know, there's a few in there that might make you sort of smile wryly, um, uh, but I don't know. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, you know, and it's such- Comedy such a, in the visual? It's such a good question. and. You know, some, sometimes there'll be a variation on that question because I obviously have, you know, political involvement with my time as a war resistor and all that stuff. Uh, do I ever find an opportunity to kind of incorporate socio-political influences in my work? And, and with the exception of something like that special edition print raising money for Ukraine, I don't, and I'm not sure why, you know, whether, whether I got a, I set photography aside that, yeah, I, you know, humor, thanks to my mother, if it, you know, my, as my sister puts it, if, if our father had been the only one raising us, neither of us would probably know how to lift a fork to our mouths. But, but fortunately, <laughs> my mother was a musician and had a wonderful sense of humor that my sister and I both benefited from. But yeah, I think maybe I set aside photography 
uh, and try to make it, let it be a different part of my life? Perhaps that's it. I mean, it's a good question, and I'm probably dancing around the answer, but that's about the best I can do. It, it, is, it is curious, but I don't know why I, I don't do either the, the humor thing or the political thing uh, in my photography. Oh, well, you know, just uh, fabulous photography, just really moving oh, and inspiring and, oh, you're and, very kind. and evocative. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for asking. Anybody else? Crickets? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for you. I, sure. I was absolutely intrigued by your time in prison. Tell us about this. Oh, well, it's ancient history. Um, you know, just uh, that picture, we just had my, the 50th anniversary of when I first went. I'd been into a couple different county jails on my way to federal prison. That's not an unusual kind of path one takes. Um, so I'm factory trained on both the county level and the federal <laughs> level in terms of incarceration. Um, but, you know, the experience, that's the important part. I, I think I feel really fortunate to have had an opportunity to kind of grasp this moral anchor in my life. Uh, I, I, I think it's a good thing. It was a good thing for me to know when I finally said, no, I can't be part of this. You know, when I first sent my draft cards back to the selective service system, I said, this is like my union card to murder incorporated. I cannot keep this in my wallet. And of course they'd keep sending me cards and threatening me with prosecution. And of course, they, their threats were not completely ill-founded because they finally did prosecute me, of course. But, um, you know, I described the, the actual prison experience itself as, you know, where I had some of the best times of my life and most of the worst times of my life, because it's not a pleasant place to be. Um, but yet it's a, it's a wonderful education. I'd only had a year and a half of college before going to prison. And I learned so much more in the year and a half of prison than I had in the year and a half of college prior to that, that uh, prison experience. So if, if you were in, in college at the time, wouldn't they have given you a pass until you graduated? Yes, and it was called a 2S student deferment. And I had one. In fact, they, um, they first, when I, the first time I sent my cards back, you know, they sent me back 1A cards, I meaning I was ready for, I was eligible, they were punishing me, and which I didn't care about. But then the federal courts ruled they could not, the Selective Service couldn't punish you by reclassifying you. They could they could prosecute me for not carrying, because you, you were required to have these cards on your person at all time if you were a male, 18 or older. But so then they reclassified me 2S again. I sent these back and said, look, I don't want your cards. Plus, I'm no longer a student. I don't even deserve this deferment. So please okay. take it. <clears throat> And you know what's funny? The day I got out of federal prison, like things you enter with, like some of your clothes I'll give you back. And um, my they had finally classified me 4F, unfit because I was a convicted felon. It's kind of like, a <laughs> but they give me yeah. here, here on this pile as I'm leaving prisoner, here are these other draft guards. So I left them there. I didn't with the others, my belongings, you know, like my wallet and stuff. I just left them there and here about a week later, they mailed them to me. So here I get these, these damn draft guards again. So I put them in and sent them to my parole officer. I said, look, I know this is violating my parole, but I am not going to carry these fucking draft cards. So uh, fortunately, um, I guess he did not, uh, he did not, they didn't prosecute me again for non-possession. Right, right. And I take it you weren't allowed to photograph while in there. No, and I, I, I you know, I smuggled out um, a diary. When you went to, when you had a visit, you know, when someone came to visit, um, you would only get a pat down search, kind of like you might get if you tripped the metal detector at the airport. Um, when you came back inside into the prison from a visit, then you'd get a strip search where you'd have to, you know, they'd make you bend over, spread your ass cheeks, lift your testicles, fluff your hair, open your mouth and, you know, all that stuff. So I was able to smuggle notes, uh, diary out. And I got this mm -hmm. notebook uh, from family that family members kept that now it's time, I, get, I need to write a book about that whole experience because I got hundreds of pages of notes talking about the prison experience and I need to really, uh, before, I, before I get too old to even write something to put that down. Well, it's a fascinating story. And, ah, and it's then, ancient history. Well, yeah, but it kind of is relevant right now, again, on so many different levels. 
and uh, yeah, I um, I I don't know. I know quite a few people. My husband is in your age group, uh -huh. and so there we know a lot of people who did not who managed not to go to to Vietnam. Um, Even some had bone that, spurs, right? But exactly, yeah. <laughs> A famous one who had bone spurs. Yeah, they don't take um, you off the golf course, but you don't want to have to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I well, I I'm glad that you you see this as um, you know that that you can say I had some of my best times there. Or yeah, there's a com <laughs> there's a camaraderie. There were, there were like twenty some war resistors when I first got there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, but you know the highest the highest percentage of inmates were bank robbers but i think you know every i think every experience we have especially if we want to label ourselves as creative people i mean every experience education family mm -hmm. life professional life you know your, your normal job anything it all contributes to the way we see the world yeah. and the way we respond to that and with our with our craft yeah well thank you thank you for sure talking about that. Um, do we have anybody else? Um, Bonnie? Yes, hi. Um, Dan, thank you so much for sharing all your work this evening with sure, us. Sure, Bonnie. Um, you haven't changed You haven't changed a bit in 16 years, Bonnie. You look, you look exactly <laughs> the same. <laughs> Unlike same. me. <laughs> you're, too, you're too kind. Neither have you. Uh, we're in that same uh, bracket. Um, no, I just wanted before we go, if you could tell us a little about about the workshop and um, what people might expect. We still have spots. Sure. And, um, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be yeah. great. Thanks for asking. Well, you you know, I think, and obviously we're going to have a good time, right? Um, but I like to break up, you know, the iPhone artistry into several areas. Capture, you know, what are what are the best methods? And you know, the formula isn't the same for everyone. We have no agenda in this class. Like I say, we're not we're not all about textures. We're not all about you know composites. But I do like to break it up for capture. What are the best ways for the way you like to make images to shoot? Do we use the native camera app that Apple gives us? Do we use Lightroom's camera, etc.? Uh, and then we get into editing, and that's everything from retouching, color, you know, color biases, etc those things for editing, then we get into stylizing. And like it or not, we are gonna cover stylizing because it's a very important part. I mean, vignettes, you know, I always joke about vignettes, they're, they're very popular because they work. They're like a visual hug on the image. They keep your viewer engaged with your image rather than drifting out of corners and sides. Uh, and then after that, after the stylized, then we're gonna talk about, you know, output, uh, some issues of printing, um, displaying work. So we're gonna really go everything from that first shutter button click all the way through. What do you do with this image if you want something tangible that you can actually show? And, you know, creating slideshows, creating a book, you know, from your iPhone, that kind of stuff. It couldn't be any more comprehensive, could it, Bonnie? Sounds great. Thanks, Dan. Sure, thanks for asking about that. You know, and the, and the, uh, the show, and I was really honored to jury uh, the Rarefied Light Show for 2022. Um, wonderful work. Um, I applaud. I was interested. Fortunately, it was a blind jurying thing, uh, which I really like. I don't like to know the names of the people or the genders, but it, uh, with the honorable mentions that Petra was going to, I think five out of the six with the five honorable mentions and the best of show, I think five out of six were female, were they not? Yes, yeah, they, they were. were. Yeah. I noticed that as well. It was interesting. I have no idea how the total the number of people out of all those nearly 500 entries, what the ratio was. Do you do you, do you have any feel for that? I don't. Not, but no. But uh, there's certainly no glass ceiling uh, in creativity, is there? Exactly. A wonderful yeah. show, and uh, you know whether the winners were male or female, it was a stupendous show, and I hope you're you're pleased with the exhibition with the final selection of photos. Can't wait. <laughs> Are there any other questions? No. Well, sure. Christine. Appreciate everyone. Oh. We now I have to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can hear me, right? I'm so bad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> um, awesome. This is beautiful. Thank you. It's also really great to see everybody, by the way. Um, I just really wanted to say the image, uh, I didn't catch what you said was the title of it, but you said it was maybe one of your favorites. It was the black and white with the woman that you were talking about. Yeah, the, about. the front view with her face in the, in the frame. It's amazing. Did you say you shot that in the 80s or was it the early 80, 90s? 83. I, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's been mentioned previously, but it was strikingly has this very resembling feature of Lady Gaga, which is very meta to me. It's interesting ah, in there. Yeah, but anyway, the first, it's, it's, that's the first time that comparison has ever been made. I appreciate it. Yeah, it, I mean, it's beautiful. It's just interesting because obviously you shot that some time ago. At, I wonder if that was even before she was born, frankly. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah well, someone can yeah. Google that right now or just ask Siri, you know, when was what's Lady Gaga's birthday? <laughs> yeah, I, it, I, anyway, probably close, closely before. But anyway, it's beautiful. And I just wanted to say that. So I appreciate the all of the work and the sharing, but uh, really kind of lit up around that one for oh, a lot of reasons. Well, that, that's the fa my favorite image in my entire portfolio. Someone mentioned you're on the East Coast. Where are you located, Christine? I'm in Manhattan. Oh, okay. You're just two hours down the road. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, from, yeah, it's two from from our front door to B&H's front door is exactly two a two hour drive if you're driving in. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask how I know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Uh, 1986. So. <laughs> <See>? <laughs> Lady wow. Gaga, 86. So three years. That was that was shot three years before, uh, before Lady Gaga was born. That's great. Th thanks for doing the research on that. That's cool. <laughs> Miss you, Christine. Thank you. Miss you guys. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> well. This has been so much fun. You know, I rarely put on a sport coat, but I want you to see, this is my uh, my water bear, <laughs> my tardigrade t-shirt here that Jill, my wife gave me. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. I'm a big fan of uh, water bears, so. Well. <laughs> Everyone's scratching their head about what the hell's a water bear. I was like, what's a water bear? <laughs> I know what a water bear is. It's like a club yeah. I'm supposed to know about because I don't know about it. <laughs> All the cool people are into water bears, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, research them. Yeah, re yeah. No, we've got a ESEM um, machine up in at the university that I teach at, and so I've had the uh, privilege and pleasure to learn how to use it. And, oh, and are super fun. Um, we've got a one credit class up here that teaches you how to use a quarter million dollar machine, oh. and then they just give it to you, and you oh get. Oh my god. And so, yeah, tardigrades were one of the things that we uh, photographed. So. Where'd you get your tardigrades? Oh, I don't know. Someone gave them to me. And, and in, in the process of coding them for the ESEM, she managed to explode most of them. So, um, oh, but, kind of but the, your tardigrades can survive radiation, temperatures, <laughs> trips through space, even, and, and here you were able to explode them there in the lab. But it's a yeah. sad story, isn't it? It's really sad. <laughs> I, well, I, want to, I want to know who's taking their Zoom and then going to Ginger, and so we can have like our old like Ginger sit down experience. Oh, anybody, anybody? We have to do that. In, we have to yeah, do that. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. <laughs> Miss yeah, a hi, Javid. Okay. No, this is the end of the part where everyone just hangs out. We just all hang out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly a nice group of people to hang out with. 